Okay, I think we'll uh, get started here. Um, so I'm Chuck Sanders. I'm the president of the Protein Society, and I would like to welcome you to Emerging Approaches in Membrane Protein Design. Um, and this is a uh, webinar that was organized by Dr. Patrick Barth. Thank you, Pat. I'm going to turn it over to him in a minute. Um, these are our speakers today. Pat will introduce them individually as they uh, queue up. And um, so that's today's webinar. And I just want to mention a couple things about the Protein Society. Our annual symposium is, is coming up July 7th through 10th in San Francisco. Um, and we're really excited uh, that this is going to go forward in person. Uh, we don't expect any major COVID complications uh, for this. And um, we hope that you'll consider attending. If you have not looked at the, the uh, program for this meeting, um, you really should take a look. It is really an exciting program. Walter Chazen really has put together, I think, a once in a decade program of excellence. And so I'm really excited about this meeting. And I think we're all going to have much fun there. So um, the next webinar will be uh, in June. And that's being organized by my colleague, Borden Lacey here at Vanderbilt. And it is on engineering proteins for a green energy future. So I hope that uh, you'll consider tuning into that. And um, if you would like to ever host a webinar, we're extremely interested in having you do so. And so you could just shoot me or Raluca Kadar, our executive director, an email, and we'll be happy to discuss that with you. It's not a lot of work, and it, you know these are high impact events. And so we hope that you'll consider uh, putting one of these together and letting us know about that. And so with no further ado, let me turn it over to Pat Barth. And um, thanks so much for attending today. Okay, well, welcome everyone to this, what we hope is going to be a very exciting webinar to you. First, I would like to, of course, thank Chuck and probably all organizers of the Protein Society to give us this fantastic opportunity to share with you, you know, our exciting work we think in, in on membrane protein design. So I'm not going to spend too much time introduction because I think the fun is really into the science, but you know, we used to think about membrane protein design as something very hard to do. I think it's still very hard, but this was largely due to the fact that you know, membrane proteins have been notoriously very difficult to study experimentally. But now things have changed, right? What we've seen in recent years are basically tremendous progress in techniques for structural determination, also for studying their folding, binding interaction, but also we've seen major progress in computational modeling and design of membrane proteins. And so through the application of these techniques, what we've come up now is through this has accelerated our understanding of molecular principles you know, that govern stability, folding, and function of not only transmembrane alpha helipoproteins, but also transmembrane beta barrels. And so we think that somehow these exciting developments now somehow set the stage you know, for uh, rationally engineering membrane protein architectures, but also binding, transport, and maybe signaling functions. And then in a way expand also the range and scope of uh, membrane protein based therapeutics. So we try you know, to identify a number of complementary topics that should be fun for you to, uh, to, um, to follow. And so um, we've been selecting uh, um, um, two uh, contributions uh, on transmembrane beta barrel uh, protein um, de design. So we have um, Anastasia Vorovieva who will be discussing um, about the de novo design of transmembrane beta barrel topologies. Then we'll have Joanna who will, uh, Sluski, who will tell us about you know, how to design you know, molecules that can actually modulate transmembrane beta barrel functions. And then we'll switch to the second part of the webinar that will be focusing on, on, on the design of alpha helical membrane proteins with a great contribution from Sarah Fleischmann who will tell us a bit about how um, you know, um, TM peptides can be uh, designed de novo from scratch, from first principle, or how they can be used to actually um, engineer a novel transmembrane helicon interaction that can fine tune receptor function. And I will end, end up the, the webinar by telling you a bit what we've been able to do in the lab in terms of designing signaling function in membrane receptors. So now I would just like to um, now um, give a few words about each of the speakers. So Anastasia is going to start this webinar, but uh, she's group leader at the Freie Universität in Brussels in Belgium. Um, and Anastasia, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you, you got your PhD in Belgium and then you went to do your postdoc in David Baker's lab. And then you spent one, you know, I think a short amount of time here at TPFL before starting your career as an independent investigator. I think one word about Anastasia, I think she, when she was in David Baker's lab in, in Seattle, she, she's basically developed a new technique 
to de novo design beta barrel uh, topologies. And this was a very hard problem. And I think this came out to be one of the major breakthrough in protein design to my point of view. And she's been then, you know, further developing the techniques and adapting them to actually now design transmembrane beta barrels. And I think she will tell us all the, the secrets behind their topologies and how to design maybe pores, etc. Then, you know, uh, we have Joanna uh, Struski. So Joanna, I think for her, there was no membrane proteins don't have any secrets, right? She she started, she done her, her PhD with Bill Degrado. Um, on uh, developing probably what was the first computational protein design technique to design transmembrane uh, protein peptides that target uh, transmembrane helical um, uh, single pass membrane receptors. And then she went to do her postdoc with um, Gunnar von Heine in Stockholm, working on, on the, on the uh, membrane protein translocation insertion. And then she now, um, in her whole lab, she now is focusing on, on uh, designing um, auto membrane proteins or regulator of auto membrane protein function. So then we'll switch to, to Sarah Fleischmann, who is professor at the Weissmann Institute. Um, so for Sarah as well, you know, membrane proteins have no secret. So he, he's done his PhD uh, with uh, Nir Bental uh, at Tel Aviv University, working on the modeling of um, single pass membrane receptors. Then he went to do his postdoc with um, David Baker in Seattle, where he developed new computational technique to design protein-protein interactions and new de novo protein binders. And then um, in his lab now, he's doing a, a wide variety of protein design uh, um, project, including um, uh, now designing from scratch um, transmembrane um, protein interactions that can regulate the function of engineered receptors. And at the end, you know, we'll, um, I will cover you know, the design of signaling membrane receptors. And so just in a few words, um, I was also trained in the membrane protein instruction function field during my PhD, I then went to UC Berkeley and USC of Washington in David Baker's lab to develop computational technique to model and design protein protein interactions, protein electrostatics, and also start developing new technique in Rosetta to model and, and design membrane protein structures. And in my lab, we now uh, combine computation experiments to try to understand how membrane receptors function and use somehow this understanding to design uh, membrane proteins with normal function. So this gives you um, 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 an overview of our skills, expertise, and I hope that what you will hear from us will be exciting to you. And so I think I would stop here just saying that, you know, each talk will be around 20 minutes, and then uh, we manage to have around 10 minutes of uh, question and answers. So please don't hesitate to, to write your questions in the Q&A section, and we'll follow up with you. Um, and then what I propose is that if some of you have more questions, we, if we cannot cover all the questions during these 10 minutes after each talk, I propose that you stay at the very end so we can gather all together and maybe continue the discussion. So I think I'm all set now with the introduction. Uh, Anastasia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Patrick. Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, so Well, thank you, Patrick, uh, for the introduction and for coordinating this session. I'm really excited about um, catching up and seeing what you've been doing um, lately or in your lab. Um, it's, yeah, it's always very exciting to hear about membrane proteins and membrane protein design. So the title of my talk is The Novel Design of Transmembrane Beta Barrels. And before I start, I just wanted to um, to briefly mention what I mean by de novo protein design, because it's been used um, in different in, in different contexts. So in, for, the, for this talk, we I, I mean uh, designing novel protein structures from uh, physical principles and starting uh, from um, a theoretical uh, backbone blueprint um, yeah, as a starting point. And so uh, de novo protein design offers uh, great new opportunities. So first, it offers unprecedented control over the protein structure uh, because the backbone is designed, is assembled first, and is used to guide the structure of uh, the sequence uh, design. But it, I hope to also convince you that it also um, offers a new and novel opportunities to study the basic principles of protein folding from the bottom up. So basically, you're not you're not anymore limited to single mutation studies. 
but you can actually have a peek into more, more global properties of, the, of proteins, the backbone architecture, uh, geometries, and more, more global protein sequence properties. So on this slide, I'm showing uh, some of the, um, so I'm showing actually uh, all of the um, de novo design membrane proteins that are currently uh, characterizing the protein data bank. So you can see that it's, uh, it's a small community, but it's, it, it's steadily growing. And my lab is interested in, this, uh, in the small protein on the top left. Um, and uh, so it's very different from, uh, from the other protein in the picture because it forms this beta sheet that curves on itself to form, uh, to form a pore for the membrane and those are transmembrane beta models. So why would we want to engineer and design transmembrane beta barrels? So there's a lot of emerging application for, the, for them. So first, transmembrane beta barrels fold into the outer membrane of uh, gram-negative bacteria, um, mitochondria, chloroplasts, and they are the entry points for many, to, for the transport of nutrients and, some, and molecules. So um, one might want to uh, engineer those, those um, entry gates to transport novel molecules, but I believe equally exciting are applications that use trans transmembrane beta barrels completely outside of the biological context in synthetic membranes. And those applications include nanopore sequencing of synthetic cells. Uh, and for this application, the, the membrane protein needs to fold and function in um, membrane environment that's very different from biological membranes in terms of composition, um, thickness, uh, charge, etc. So there's a lot of opportunities for, um, for membrane protein design. But there are also, there are also many challenging challenges. So this is the outline of my talk, some of the challenges that uh, we tackled uh, working on this project. So uh, the principles to assemble, um, beta barrel backbones, um, the design or the, um, the design of GMB specific energy functions, but also experimental validation. This is important because you need to show, like, how do you show that your designs are actually folded? So, for water soluble proteins, there's a growing amount of data and evidence that really uh, start, started to to define the different um, alternative states and, uh, and molten globules, et cetera, that, that can result in, in, in the field, field design, but for membrane proteins, this doesn't exist. Okay, so how to assemble beta barrel backbone. So, um, for, um, so historically, beta barrels have been described um, using parametric equations. So, um, one can fit some, um, one, can, one can fit parametric lines uh, along the beta strands. And um, so this is what we did. We started by generating, um, generating beta barrel backbones using one of, the, one of such parametric equation. So which results in an arrangement of very regular, um, very regular beta strands. So uh, we then connected those beta strands with loops and to uh, test our backbone building strategy, we first work on water soluble beta barrels. So we made water soluble beta barrels design and we made quite a lot of them. And none of these uh, designs um, based on this parametric equation actually um, uh, was um, appeared to, appear to fold. And many of them actually show signs of cytotoxicity when expressed uh, in E. coli. And so what we found is that when, by looking closer to this, at these backbones, is that actually after uh, computationally designing the sequence or after relaxation, we could see those strands, the, the parametrically generated strands splitting and the hydrogen bond, uh, a significant portion part of the hydrogen bonds breaking, up, breaking apart. And we could see that for all the uh, parametric models that we tested. So this hints at some strain that's building up in the beta barrel backbones. So we sought to characterize further the strain 
And this time we relaxed the back bones, but with constraints to maintain the hydrogen bonds. And we looked where, at um, position where strain will build up. And we found, uh, we found some signs of clashes and repulsion energy building up between side chains pointing in the core to the core of the beta barrel. Sorry, to the core of the beta barrel along the, the um, along the um, the hydrogen bonds. So we reasoned that we could relieve the strain by introducing uh, by removing one side chain, and so this is what we did. So we replaced one of this side chain with a, one of this residue with a glycine, and we show that now we had we could build back bonds with reduced strain, and that would maintain. Um, the old, the um, required hydrogen bonds after relaxation. However, we also saw that those backbones were significantly distorted after after this this relaxation. So basically, what we saw is that from this very regular arrangements of beta strands, the the, the position where we introduced the glycines were now forming this distortional irregularities of kink in in uh, the in the cross section of the barrel. So, with all this um, evidence, we decided that um, parametric generation of beta barrel backbones was probably not the optimal way to generate beta barrels, and we turned it to we turned to an alternative approach, where we um, assembled the the beta barrel bag backbones from 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 small protein, from small fragments um, extracted from the PDB, uh, which is the, the classic Rosetta approach. Um, and this approach also offers a real opportunity here because to, to really shape the, 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 beta, the beta barrel, to mold the beta barrel, because those those kinks associated with, gly with glycine kink have very particular, uh, all located in a very particular space of the Ramachandran plot, the yellow space um, he sh E shown here on, on the left. And so we can actually explicitly place such, um, such uh, residues as, as building block in the, in the um, backbone blueprint to generate bl blueprints with that would correspond to backbones with a specific cross section. So here we, we have glycine kings defining four corners with, to, to make this square shape. So uh, again, we, dis, we use those backbones to design water soluble beta barrel. This, uh, again, uh, and out of four designs, one of them appeared to properly fold, and we could solve the crystal structure of the design that was very similar to the expected design model. And what was even more exciting is that we could really see the shape, the shape of the cross section was maintained, that was um, shaped by these glycine kings, was maintained in the, in, in the structure. And that was unique uh, and not observed, unique to the design and not observed in, in native proteins. Okay, so now we, we know how to build beta barrel backbones, but how do we go from a, um, from a water soluble to transmembrane beta barrel. So we found that the two uh, type of barrels had very similar backbones and the difference was really in the sequence. So, um, so the, the water soluble barrels have a polar surface and a hydrophobic core. Transmembrane beta barrel have a hydrophobic surface exposed to, to, to the lipid membrane and a polar core. So to, to um, so to control the, this balance of amino acids, we need, uh, we need uh, a good energy function. So a prerequisite to uh, train a, an energy function is to uh, have data, experimental data, and to have a good understanding of the bare physical principles of folding, which for beta barrels at this point was, uh, was, was very limited. So we decided to take a little bit on conventional approach um, and to generate designs based on some hypothetical sequence models. So we, we make hypotheses, we build designs that satisfy those hypotheses, and we see if those can, can hold. So the first hypothesis that we tested is the inside-out model. So inside-out as opposed to the water-soluble barrel. 
So the core of these of this designs was, were entirely polar. And we tried to really emphasize the difference um, between the, the, the surface and the core by introducing more charged residues into the core. The surface is, uh, is completely hydrophobic. So you can see um, on, this, uh, on this graph, the, um, the amino acid distributions of, this, uh, of these designs as compared to uh, natural TMBs. Um, and you can see that we, we indeed had an enrichment in, in, in charged um, amino acids. So in this configuration, what we get is uh, our sequences that have very optimal secondary structure propensity because we have a very good uh, alternation between polar uh, between polar and hydrophobic um, uh, residues, which is a signature of beta strands. We also have an op optimized tertiary structure because of Rosetta design, and so this is the kind of the paradigm, the current paradigm, paradigm in the novel design, so to optimize the secondary and tertiary structures. However, in the case of the of TMBs, what we saw is that with this model, we, did, we actually did not see any expression at all. So in this case, we express the protein in um, we, we were expecting we we're expressing them in the cytoplasm and expecting them to go to the to the inclusion bodies, but there was no expression. As a second hypothesis, we also uh, focused on the inside out model, but with reduced charge. So the core is again all polar, the surface all hydrophobic, but now we can see that the amino acid distributions are closer to the native uh, sequences. We have again um, up really high secondary structure propensity, optimized tertiary structure, but again, no expression. So for the third, um, round of design, we still did not have any feedback from a previous round of design, ex ex except the uh, no expression. Um, and so we, we thought that maybe, maybe um, what, what can happen is that if the, um, if, if the protein falls too quickly in a beta sheet as it goes out of the ribosome, maybe it's, it's just like programmed to fold and since there is no membrane to interact with, it could either interact with uh, specifically with different parts of the cell and results in uh, cytotoxicity. So we decided to um, instead here for the third one of design, destabilize local secondary structure by negative design. And we've done that by disrupting the, um, this very, like, very characteristic alternation between polar and hydrophobic residues and disrupt the beta strand pattern. So we designed core network of polar residues that are inter intertwined with hydrophobic residues. And again, we have um, we have sequences that uh, resembles uh, natural sequences. And this time with this with this model, so we destabilized local secondary structure by negative design and optimized tertiary structure. We could express a protein. So, um, so that was the good news. So now we had to, so now we had to show that these proteins that we can express as insoluble proteins in inclusion bodies can actually fold. And for this, we um, investigated their folding in um, synthetic membranes. Um, and we exploited some uh, tryptophans that we designed uh, on the surface of the proteins. So, um, so that when the, when the design so inserting in the membrane, uh, that results in a characteristic uh, shift of in tryptophan fluorescence. And we showed using this approach that we have spontaneous and reversible folding of the designs into synthetic membranes. We also looked at the folding kinetics of the designs um, and basically the assumption here is that if the designs actually fold in, into the, in, the, into, in the membrane and not in water, then we would see a difference in kinetics as we increase the, the membrane thickness. And this is indeed what we, should, what we saw. So the designs are folding very fast in thin bilayer and slow, more slowly in, thicker, in a thicker bilayer. 
we also saw the structure of uh, the design of one of the designs, the crystal structure and the crystal structures but it was very similar to the design model with again, we we're very excited that, to see those that um, so, so at the level of the side chains, but also at the level of this uh, pore cross section that we designed using glycine cakes. So now we are working on designing a larger transmembrane beta barrel pores. So of 10, 12, and 14 strands. Um, and what we showed so far is that those larger TMBs obey the same negative design principles. So, but unfortunately we couldn't use the, or, um, or previously, uh, we couldn't use our um, energy functions because um, of, um, because the, the, the core, the pore of this uh, larger barrels is more solvent accessible. So we could incorporate less hydrophobic residues. And at the end, we could see no expression. So we, um, we made new energy functions specifically for those larger solvent accessible pores. And um, we, we, we did so by, um, again, by destabilizing, uh, in, in order to destabilize local secondary structure. And with this, um, with, with those new um, energy functions, we were able to design 10 strands designs, uh, TMB designs. So uh, for one of the designs, we, we were able to solve a, a crystal structure that was again, very close to the design model um, and show that they fold um, reversibly in, in, in lipids. So we also um, trying to exploit the glycine kinks uh, to control the shape of the of the pore by placing those pores uh, by placing those glycine kings we we, we can we, um, so we built in um, we, we built in beta barrel pores that have very characteristic uh, shape of the lumen and we have design for these designs we we have um, evidence by physical evidence that some of the designs fall but of course we need uh, we are now working on structural characterization to um, actually investigate the, 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 in more details the accuracy of the design. So to conclude, we, um, we showed that um, torsional irregularities, in particular glass and kings, are necessary to relieve the strain in the backbone uh, of, um, of beta barrels, and that they can be used to shape the beta barrel. And uh, that TMBs are like previously designed proteins because they require negative design um, to destabilize like a, a local secondary structure. So we think that, um, so we, we think that um, the reason for that is that the, um, is that the, um, there, there is, um, so it, when, when the, the, the protein, um, uh, if the protein falls, it, it's, it has the risk of uh, aggregating. So an aggregation is a kinetic trap that prevents proper folding. So um, with that, I would like to thank so many people who contributed to this work uh, in, in David's lab um, and also in, in my new lab in Brussels. But we also had a lot of fantastic collaborators who will always um, bring us some some really uh, beautiful uh, protein folding folding data in membranes, and we can we can literally see the protein fold um, folds in, in the membranes in, in, in the data. So that was really exciting to work with uh, with all of these talented people. So with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Good. Well, thank you so much, Anastasia, for this very exciting talk. So the floor is open for questions. I guess I see already Sarah with uh, raising the hand. So go ahead, Sarah. Uh, yeah, this was a great talk. I, I was wondering about the second negative design principle, which you described about the sort of intercalated hydrogen bonding pattern in the barrel. Um, do you think when you mentioned negative uh, design in this case, what are the negative states that you envision? Are those trans swap beta barrels or, or aggregates or what, what do you think is happening? Well, uh, I mean, I think those are, those are aggregated states. Uh, it could be, I mean, 
of course there could be other there could be one could imagine other states like um, inserting in the inner membrane or I personally think those are aggregation uh, because I mean if you have a, a protein that's very quickly fold to, to a better sheet it will fold in a better sheet as, as soon as it goes out of the ribosome um, so yeah so, so this is what we're trying to destabilize against makes sense thank you Okay, so maybe we can go to the Q and A chat here. So we have one question from Ben Hardy. You know, what would be required to express the transmembrane barrels into the membrane in vivo rather rather than inclusion bodies? Yes, that's a very good question. So, um, so we we have collaborators who who try to express those proteins in the outer membrane. And what we saw, I mean, they, they don't, they, basically, they don't go there. Uh, what, what we see is that as soon as you get a signal peptide, then the protein is gone, maybe uh, degraded by the uh, periplasmic um, proteases. We, we don't know yet what's happening. So, um, and this is a very, um, this, was, this is a very exciting question because in order to get to the outer membrane, the protein needs to engage into that uh, biogenesis pathway interact with all those chaperones uh, while remaining unfolded until the, uh, until it reaches the outer membrane. So there is a lot of ways this could go wrong, and we are hoping actually to use those designs uh, to to be able to to learn more about about the pathway. But so far, this is as far as we, as we got. <laughs> okay, thanks for this great answer. We take uh, Joanna now. Great talk and um, especially thought provoking to see the comparison of the membrane barrel and the soluble barrel. Something that we've seen just in terms of looking at data sets of, of barrels has been that there is a, um, when you talked about the uh, hydrophobicity alternation, we see that it falls off pretty quickly for membrane barrels, but even there's even less hydrophobicity alternation for soluble barrels. When you look, do you, did you have, I guess, classic um, hydrophobicity alternation in your soluble barrels or? Uh, yes, we, we did. We did. I think one, one um, reason for, for, for what you see is that most soluble barrels or uh, lipocalins, mm -hmm. uh, which, bind, which bind small molecules and have uh, polar pockets, and this, I mean, they, they, they do have a hydrophobic pore in the bottom, but most of the of the barrel is occupied by, by um, the um, by the pocket. But you can make a perfectly uh, alternating soluble, mm -hmm. and it works. It works for soluble, but yeah. not for membrane. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Okay, we have another question from Julia. Julia. Have you tried the frontling energy function, which has also a poor model available? Well, we haven't tried it at the time where we were uh, first working on this. Um, it, it was um, not yet available. It is also meant to design the, um, the protein lipid interface. And what we showed is that the, the core of the, um, of the protein is equally important. Um, but definitely, I think it, it will be great to, uh, to kind of combine the two, the two approaches um, in, into one and see how, how well does, yeah, the, that, that will perform. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Mohammed who is wondering about the role of tryptophans that you put on the outside. Are they just to measure fluorescence or does it have any other importance? Can you elaborate on that? Well, uh, those tryptophan uh, were um, basically th that's that's kind of um, in the in those designs. It's mimicking the water lipid interface of uh, natural beta barrels that have uh, aromatic residues, uh, tryptophan tyrosines at um, at this these interfaces. Um, so yeah, so it is. 
a way to, to delimit the, uh, the water lipid uh, boundary. And it, it's been shown to be stabilizing the beta barrel. I don't know, I think it's not uh, absolutely crucial to have it here. I think people have mutated the way and it's, it's still holds. Okay, I think Chuck has a question. Yeah, so um, I, I really loved your folding kinetic and insertion experiments. Um, it's amazing to me that that worked. Um, do, do, do you have any evidence so that it uh, inserted in only a single orientation and not random 50 50? Um, yeah, so for, um, for transmembrane beta barrels, the current model is that uh, if you go from the unfolded chain to the, to the folded state, uh, the, the folding is, is oriented. So uh, you, would, you would end up uh, with uh, the, same, the same orientation um, for, for all, for all the, the proteins. So we need to, to test, we still need to test that for, for designer proteins. We have no evidence yet of that, but that's the current model for native proteins. So we have a question from Claudio, who's wondering about potential bio, biotechnological applications for your de novo design beta barrels, and he's asking whether it would be easier to modify existing proteins. Um, well, I mean, existing proteins are modified uh, currently, and I think the um, for for beta barrels, for transmembrane beta barrels in particular. Um, it's a lot, there's a lot, of, for example, if you consider um, sensing nanopores, uh, the same pores are used for, for, to sense many analytes, um, sometimes with point mutations. And what we see is that um, in many uh, cases, those, uh, those are suboptimal because they don't really perfectly fit the, the analyte. So for this kind of application, I think um, being able to, to accurately and closely control the shape of the barrel to fit a specific analyte and have a close contact to the analyte would actually, um, would actually um, be a step forward for this particular biotechnology for any applications. Ah, okay, great answer. Um, we have Paul Kerner who is asking whether barrel folding is actually influenced by membrane lateral pressure, as for ONPA, and he's wondering whether there is a fundamental pro this is a fundamental property of TM barrels, whether they are actually natural or designed. That's a that's a great question. Um, to be to, yeah, to be honest, we haven't yet um, in, investigated the property the, those the effect of. The, the full effect of the membrane on the folding of these uh, synthetic barrels. But this is something that we definitely want to do. Um, but that will, yes, indeed, that will be very exci exciting to see how they behave and how, yeah, that's a, but that's a great question. We, we just don't have an answer yet. Good. Um, I think we have a question on whether it's possible to make and produce a large barrel that is hydrophobic inside and hydrophobic outside. So I'm not sure whether that applies to transmembrane or soluble barrels, but do you have any, any comment on that? Well, uh, if with a pore, I think, um, I mean, the for a soluble barrel, the, the the hydrophobic effect is the main, the, one of the main driving force um, for, for folding. So um, I think it's going to be challenging to make a pore, a hydrophobic pore. It's probably going to collapse on itself. Um, but maybe, yeah, maybe maybe a better sandwich. And <laughs> that's would be yeah, that would be interesting to to try. Okay, so we'll end up with. I just have a very quick question. I was just wondering about your negative design features like glycine kings, you know, is it something that is very specific to the de novo topologies that you design or are they also found, you know, in a number of natural beta barrels? No, they, they are, also, yeah, they're also found in natural beta barrels mm -hmm. um, in both soluble and membrane beta barrels. If you look at GFP, it has conserved glycine king positions. Uh, so they definitely, it's 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 more a mechanical property, a mechanical um, principle of 
of the beta sheets. Um, okay. Thank you. So maybe we start with just one last question from Bob, who's asking about you transfusing any soluble domain to your TMDs. And do you think this would allow expression of some of your non-expressing designs by self chat running and or assisting with the in vivo experiments? Um, well, we haven't tried to fuse uh, anything to the NOC terminal. We've tried to fuse um, small small peptides and domains into loops. And um, depending on the on the loops, on the side of the barrel, we can actually um, we, we see folding. Um, in, but um, in terms of um, assisting expression, so we actually did the experiments. We, um, we took one of the early designs that did not express, and we replaced short, the short beta turn that we had there with the loops of uh, the long loops of on A. Um, and in that case, we still did not see any ex expression. Well, on A with the short loops that we use in the design, we see expression. So it's really the beta, the, the, the transmembrane beta barrel parts of the protein that drives this, this um, expression or no expression. Um, um, Okay, thanks Anastasia for the great talk and thanks for the audience for all the stimulating question and answers. Let's move on with Joanna. Joanna, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Chuck, for um, making, you know, allowing this to happen and Raluca for supporting this. Thanks, Patrick, for setting up this uh, session. I'm really excited to hear everybody else's talk and excited to be a part of it. I'm Joanna Slusky. I'm generally at the University of Kansas. This year, I'm on sabbatical in Stockholm, visiting with Arna Ellipson's lab and Lynn Kammerlin's lab, Dan Daly's lab. And in my lab, we work with beta barrels. And so here is a picture of us playing cat's cradle with beta barrels. And I like to start with an aphorism and that aphorism is that most people like to say that it's not what's on the outside that counts, it's what's on the inside that counts. But in my lab, we like to say the opposite. We like to say it's what's on the outside that counts. And that's not because we are camping enthusiasts, although some of us are. Um, it's not because we're necessarily materialist, materialistic, although uh, maybe some of us are that as well. Um, but it's fundamentally because we look at the outer membrane and like Anastasia, we see that this is an amazing platform for design. So right, most um, organisms don't have an outer membrane, but gram-negative bacteria do. And you can see this beautiful picture of a gram-negative bacterium by David Goodsell. And so we're talking about right here, that spot between the inside and the outside can therefore control the interaction between the cell and its environment. And so we can deal with things like antibiotic resistance uh, where, and here is the specific pump I'm gonna talk about today, uh, where if we could disable the pump, we could stop antibiotics from being pushed out of the cell. We could make enzymes at the surface, and this is something that my lab is interested in as well. If we could make enzymes at the surface of cells, then it could degrade pollutants without having to bring in the substrates or export the products. We could also use the same principle of um, stopping pores to possibly create pores or enhance pores in mitochondria, which also have outer membranes in order to uh, be able to facilitate the export of cytochrome C and trigger apoptosis in something like a tumor. And so there are all kinds of things that being at the surface allow you to do, and we are interested in them. And so today I'll be talking about antibiotic resistance specifically. Antibiotic resistance is a looming public health crisis. I feel like, man, everything nowadays is a looming public health crisis. Um, but antibiotic resistance is predicted to have cause more deaths than cancer by 2050. Uh, and so this is something we are interested in targeting. And to target antibiotic resistance, you wanna sort of have a general understanding of what is going on with antibiotic resistance. So here is my oversimplification of what is going on, which is that generally speaking, a cell will have, a bacterial cell will have various targets for antibiotics. And those could be um, in the membrane as well, but here I'm picturing them in the cytosol. 
And so the idea is with various types of antibiotics, right, you bind the target and that causes cell death in some way. So to have antibiotic resistance, then you can modify the target, right? Then the antibiotic can't bind the target. And then that particular type of antibiotic can't cause cell death. But of course, that's very specific to a specific antibiotic. Um, you can also have enzymatic inactivation of antibiotics where an antibiotic is cleaved, then it can't bind its target either. Again, that specific class of antibiotics can't cause uh, cell death, but there is a more general situation where all of the antibiotics can just be sort of pushed non-specifically out of the cell. And that's what we wanted to do because it, it really reaches all kinds of antibiotics. And so the theory was, hey, if we could disable this pump in some way, then we could keep the antibiotics in the cell and then the antibiotics would be able to kill the cell or cause bacteriostasis. Anyway, stop an infection. And so um, the natural target for this is the, what's sometimes called the acridine efflux pump, also called acra A, acra B, toll C. Uh, which is this pump you see here, which passes the broadest range of antibiotics. This is basically the, the one and only in E. coli. And this one pump pushes out like chloramphenicol and tetracyclines and macrolides and aminoglycosides and quaternary compounds, triclosan, uh, even the pine oil that's used in pine scented cleaner just pushes it right out. So we're not the only people who thought this is a great target. A lot of people have worked on trying to find drugs that bind this acrid B drug binding site. And drug binding sites are really good for binding drugs, so I don't blame them. Uh, but what's been found is number one, it's difficult to access, right? Because to get from the outside of the cell in, you've got across the outer membrane, which is quite impermeable. Uh, and also things that have been found to bind over here have ultimately been toxic in the clinic over and over again. And it seems that there is actually some structural homology between this drug binding site and, and mammalian sites that's causing these kind of off-target reactions and toxicity in the clinic. And so we said, hey, if we target this outer membrane protein, maybe it will be easier to access because you can just sort of come in from the outside over here. And second of all, wouldn't it be less toxic because mammalian protein, mammalian cells simply don't have this kind of outer membrane protein. Right, we can talk more about that later if you'd like. But so then, we started with, well, what binds to outer membrane proteins? And the answer that we were coming to was bacteriocins. Um, and we didn't invent bacteriocins, bacteria invented bacteriocins. Bacteria invented these for bacterial warfare. And I'll just tell you the convention for bacteriocins. Um, bacteriocins is the general term. We'll talk about colicins. Those are from E. coli. So coli for colicins. Um, if we were talking about the ones from Yersinia pestis, they would be pesticins, et cetera. So these bacteriocins in general tend to have these three domain architectures where you've got a translocation domain at the end terminus over here, a receptor binding domain in the middle and the cytotoxic domain over here. And the way that they bind to the outer membrane is sort of the general idea is usually first the R domain binds first, that's that fisherman over there, because once the R domain binds, then it's looking for the other types of proteins that the T domain binds to. Okay, so the R domain binds, then the T domain binds, and then in some way, and it's different for different ones, um, it pulls in the cytotoxic domain. Once the cytotoxic domain is in, right, that's what kills the cell. So how do we plug Tol C? How can we disable this? antibiotic pump, um, one thought was to use a bacteriocin. And so this is an idea by Jimmy Budiarjo in my lab, where he said, you know, there is a bacteriocin that is known to interact with Tulsi. Maybe that could be used for a plug. And if we could plug Tulsi, then we could stop antibiotics from getting pushed out. So here was what was known about colicin E1 interacting with Tulsi. So there are two models. Here's the first model. And in this model, you've got the T domain and everybody says the T domain is what interacts with Tulsi. So you've got the T domain interacting with Tulsi over here, the R domain, which binds to B2B and the C domain over here, which ultimately in some way gets brought in. So that's the pillar model. And the reason it's called the pillar model is because over in Tulsi, this sits here solid like a pillar, okay? And so when the C domain comes in, it maybe comes in along the side or something like that, unclear. Then you've got the total thread model, and this is based on colicin E9, 
where the R domain binds to B2B, and then the T domain interacts with Tulsi, but doesn't really stay bound because once it comes to Tulsi, it pulls the whole thing through. Okay, so when we're looking for a plug, the question, of course, was how does it actually insert? Because that's going to matter on whether or not we can have a plug. Uh, and number two, and I can't see my, this question because it's blocked um, by my screen sharing information. Um, you can read it. I don't know the question. So, but I, I guess I will just say that um, with respect to this talk, then I'm really going to be talking about helical interactions with the beta barrel on the outside. And so this is a great bridge between Anastasia's great talk about beta barrels and moving to um, helical proteins, because here we're seeing that these helices can really interact with um, Tulsi. And so the evidence for the pillar model, which we were really hoping for, was number one, that there was a TMELF that showed that the NNC terminus of the T domain, so that's, if you look at the NNC terminus, that's over here and over here, that they're both necessary for folding and solution. And you can see that here, that basically you need all of residues, either one to 190 or 41 to 190. Um, that's what folds, uh, but otherwise it doesn't fold. Um, and that uh, the apex of this hairpin, so basically this whole piece over here, um, can stop electrical conductance or at least minimize it, right? So that's what you're seeing with this red curve over here. One to 140 will minimize electrical conductance, but one to 100 does not. So you need more of that T domain to do it. Um, and that CD ultimately shows that the helical content that you get for the solution, um, for the solution T domain is not lost upon binding to C. So whatever you have in solution, it looked like it was a hairpin in solution should be what it is in the membrane. So we, in order to do this, uh, we wanted to do it easy. It, not things aren't always easy, uh, but it can be quite laborious to do, deal with membrane proteins. Um, and especially with C, you couldn't refold it in vitro. You had to isolate it from membranes. Um, and Jimmy and Paul in my lab thought that was annoying. And so they figured out a way to fold it in vitro which hadn't been done before. But the thing about it is, is that this Tulsi here, it's a trimer. So each strand, each um, chain is a different color, purple. You can see it better here, maybe. Okay, and so they got it into nanodisks by basically concentrating it, realizing that it was gonna need just lots of, lots of Tulsi together in order to insert. And that was something that hadn't previously been known. So here you can see one of the things, I don't think Anastasia said it, but one of the cool things about a lot of, um, beta barrels is that there's something called heat modification where uh, on an SDS page gel, it maintains its barrel shape unless you boil it. So here you have um, unboiled and boiled um, and it's all this monomer. But once you concentrate in the presence of micelles or nanodisks, uh, then when it's boiled, you still see it um, decompose into a monomer. But when it's unboiled, you can see it as a trimer. And in fact, you can even see um, as you concentrate it more and more and more, there's more and more trimer. Okay, so now we can get Tulsi and we can work with it really easily. And so now we need the colicin E1 um, protein. And so here's the T, R, and C domains. We're just going to start with the T domain. And the first question was, you know, does this um, bind? And so the answer was the colicin E1T domain by itself will bind to C. And so you can see this on SEC where you've got a coli one t over here and um, C in purple. And if you put them together, what you see is that you can shift that peak over. And if you take an SCS page gel of that peak, you see that both coli one t and C are in that peak. So we're like, okay, so we can purify it together. Let's get the structure. And so we worked with um, an amazing cryo EM uh, spectroscopist uh, uh, Jason Kalber uh, and Emery Furlar, who we thought we were going to get something like the pillar model, where the T domain binds like that. And in the end, it turned out that there's something sort of a, of a switchblade model where it opens up and inserts like this, but stays there. So here we have the cryo EM structure of Tulsi with colicin E1T. Um, and we got it down to three angstrom resolution. And that was uh, partly because of some amazing work by David Case with uh, MD simulations. But 
ultimately, uh, it goes into n terminus first. So it does go in the way you would think it would. Um, that part that was a hairpin when it was making um, sort of a helix helix interaction becomes a kink. Uh, and, and here's this, you can sort of see here a little bit better that it binds asymmetrically. So this structure was refined by David Case um, with uh, molecular dynamics. Uh, it's somewhat loose in the periplasm. It doesn't have uh, close contacts in the periplasm. The close contacts are actually in the beta barrel, my favorite place, that was great. Um, and you can see some of those polar interactions here. Okay, so then the question was, well, what happens with this and actual cells? And so the first thing we found was that although the T domain binds to TOL C, it doesn't bind to the cells. So we can do this by basically throwing um, his tagged T domain onto cells and then washing them off and then seeing if we can still see the his tag. And we looked for it both inside and outside because maybe it pulled in, didn't. Um, so we don't see it at all anywhere. Um, and so we do this trips and digest to see if it's at the surface. It's not anywhere. Um, Sir A, a periplasmic control, it's totally there. Uh, whereas if we add the receptor binding domain, we do see it. Okay, so here um, it sticks to the surface of intact cells, um, but then when you add trypsin, it gets digested uh, and lice cells also digested, but it's, it's on the surface. It comes and it sticks to the surface. So we're really intrigued by that. And so I got a friend of mine, Julie Bettine, who does single molecule spectroscopy uh, and said like, well, what, what does this look like on the cell surface? So we attached the Psi3 small you know, molecular probe and we were able to see these small puncta on the surface of the bacteria. Okay, so about 94% of all of the regular bacteria that had TOL-C would get these puncta and they pretty much, it was one punctum per cell. Uh, and you can see they were very stable. This could go on for five minutes um, that, that they would, you would get about 20 or so binding events all in the same place. Um, and it would just be very, very stable. And these are not fixed cells. Uh, but if you have a Delta TOL-C, right, TOL-C is not there, then you don't get that binding. If um, you have delta B G B, you don't get that binding. Okay, so it's just, it's just binding when you've got TOL-C and BGB and it, the clustering and the binding doesn't seem to at all be mediated by the Psi3 a marker. We try this with GFP and we get the same thing. Okay, so it binds the cell surface and it creates these puncta. The question though was like, with respect to antibiotic resistance, can we actually plug TOL-C? So we did a real-time efflux analysis, uh, right? Because if you can plug TOL-C, then you can stop antibiotics from going out. And so with this efflux analysis, um, uh, measuring real-time efflux, the idea is that you use a fluorophore as a stand-in for antibiotics. So the fluorophore has two important properties. Number one, it's effluxed by the same uh, proteins as the antibiotics are effluxed by, the acridine efflux pump. And number two, it only fluoresces when it's in the cell. So what happens is we can turn the proton mode of course off with uh, CCCP. Uh, and then the small fluorophore will passively diffuse in. And the more it diffuses in, the more efflux, the more, sorry, fluorescence intensity you will get. It will sort of level off. And that's when we start measuring. We can turn um, efflux back on by just adding glucose. Right, so that uh, renormalizes the uh, PMF. And so then if efflux is working, it will push that fluorophore right out. Whoosh, um, and that means that efflux is working. If you've got a delta toll C, right, then efflux doesn't work. And so it stays constant and can't push out that fluorophore. Um, what happens when you've got about 10 micromolar coli one TR? Well, you get sort of transient stopping of the efflux, but if you add 100 micromolar, which yes, is a lot, then you can really totally abrogate efflux. Uh, and so then the question finally is, well, does it actually potentiate antibiotics? And I think uh, yes, at least with high amounts of colosine one tr So we're looking at minimum inhibitory concentration assays. This is how much antibiotic does it take to kill the cell? So less is better, right? Because um, resistance is more antibiotics it takes to kill the cell. So wild type is a lot of antibiotics. 
total C is less. This is for erythromycin. Um, but when we add 10 or 100 micromolar of the anti of um, CoE1TR, we can reduce how much antibiotics it takes, and not just for erythromycin, but also for benzalkonium chloride and for, for ciprofloxacin and for canamycin, although we don't have a negative control for canamycin because um, delta tol C is through the KO collection, it's can cassette. So, uh, but, but you can see the effect. Um, and so of course, like if uh, the acridine efflux pump is pushing out all of these types of antibiotics, then it, then it is effective in a large number of antibiotics. So biologically then it seems to work, but what is going on with respect to the mechanism of this colicin? And the answer is, we don't know. But if previously you've got like the C domain and the R domain and the T domain, and you've got TOL C um, and you've got here BTUB. And so the previous pillar model was to say, okay, it binds to BTUB, it binds like this to TOL C, then the C domain goes in on the side. Um, that's not the case. The previous uh, other models all had binding to BTUB um, and binding to TOL C more through. But the question still remains like, is it to total thread? Does the whole thing pull through? We don't see that pull through event happen, at least with these, these, um, these shortened versions. Um, or is it something of a modified pillar where it does say stable, although not in the particular confirmation that was previously proposed um, and the C domain still maybe goes in the side in some way. So that's something we still don't know. So in summary, with respect to antibiotic resistance, the T domain of the colicin E1 plugs TOLC in its open hinge configuration with specific contacts in the beta region. The TR domain binds the cell surface, uh, makes TOLC B2B dependent puncta. They're very stable. Uh, ultimately, the coli one tr will inhibit efflux uh, and it will potentiate antibiotics. And so we are looking forward to this idea of using ultimately colicins to, there are lots of colicins, they don't just do TOLC, but there are a number of colicins that target all kinds of outer membrane proteins. And so we are looking to a more general mechanism of colicin outer membrane pairs as a method of modulating function at the cell surface. Um, before I finish, I do wanna mention, I'm in Stockholm now, I love Stockholm. You might like Stockholm too, um, I am co, organizing a biophysical society thematic meeting on visible and quantitative approaches to overcome antibiotic resistance. And that's in August in Stockholm. Uh, I think that uh, abstracts are still open for another month or so, and I would love to see you there. Um, and with that, I would like to thank everyone in the Slusky lab, but especially the people who did this work. So uh, Jimmy Budiarjo was the real mover on this project and man, he, really moved it. Um, Jackie Stevens, also over here. Uh, Paul uh, Ayutundi Ikujuni. Uh, we've got Berenfika Wilmasena and amazing collaborators, uh, Jason Kalber, Emery Ferlar, David Case at Rutgers, Julie Bettina and Anna Calkins at the University of Michigan, and my funders. And thank you for your attention. I'd love to take questions. Great. Thanks, uh, Joanna, for a great talk. Very inspiring. And the floor is open for questions. So, um, Sarah, who was first? Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Joanna. This is great. Uh, I have a question. I, I'm, I'm sure you considered this. Um, it seems like the KI is, is high for this um, solubilized um, helix hairpin, right? That uh, mm -hmm. seems to uh, inhibit only at fairly high concentrations. Do you have, um, what, what do you think is, is, is the reason for that? Because it seems like this would be a very tight, like once it's plugged, it probably doesn't dissociate ever, right? Yeah, um, I, I, I don't know. I have, so the, what, when it needs to biologically come in, right, it probably, you only need like one or two events to kill the cell. I don't know, but, but you don't need so many events to kill the cell. So it's not meant to have a lot of binding. Whereas if any Tulsi's are left unbound, then they will efflux and, and efflux will still happen and things like that. So um, partly that's it is that it was never designed to like potentiating antibiotics is great, but, but bacteria had their own you know, cytotoxic things that they were doing with this and they weren't using it as a plug. And it's not a great plug, um, it's an okay plug. Uh, and I think we can, with computational design, make it a better plug. 
but I think part of it is like, it was just never designed to bind um, so tightly. I think that there's, and what does that mean? Because it does actually bind extremely tightly, specifically with B2B and in vitro, we can get it to bind quite well to Tulsi, but when it, you need to create these situations, you need B2B to be right next to Tulsi mm -hmm. for this to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that there are clusters, especially of outer membrane proteins in the outer membrane, but, but geometrically, when apparently we're getting about 20 binding events at a time, um, Maybe, maybe there's some geometric constriction in the two-dimensional plane with respect to how many B2Bs do you have here and how many Tulsi's do you have here? And maybe there are other proteins there too that are not, you know, specifically involved in this, you know, bacterial warfare. I mean, because it's not, nobody wants to make yourself susceptible to bacterial warfare. So, so I think there must be some, especially with seeing these puncta that form, there must be some geometric constriction to how it happens that the Tulsi and the B2B are right next to each other. The lights just went out and not moving enough. Okay. Okay, I think we have time maybe for one or two more questions. Anastasia. Thank you. Thank you, John. And that was really exciting. Um, I was wondering, because if I recall well, uh, Tulsi is a trimer. Mm -hmm. um, can you fit a trim, like, can you? fit a uh, free illnesses in, in, in that form? It's a secret, but yes. <laughs> um, well, so no, no not, not these, not these helices. These helices, because of the way they go through the whole way, no. But if you make smaller short hel helices, um, then yes, we've been able to get through. Yeah, very exciting. <laughs> okay, maybe just last question. Uh, from Joseph, does uh, TR domain binding to E. coli surface depend on A, C, R, A, or A, C, R, and B? And can you prevent import of collecting e, E1 with a large fusion? Uh, okay, does TR binding? No. The TR binding, uh, so interesting. I don't, so. We did not do it in an ACRA A or ACRA B deletion, so I can't promise. Uh, but I can tell you that when we can delete the first 40 residues and we see the binding the same. So anything that's going past there, we does not seem to have an effect. Uh, maybe that's the best, the most in information I have in order to answer that part. Can you prevent import of colosin E1 with large fusion? Uh, I've never, so it's, it's, it's a technological, it's totally doable, um, but it is a technological challenge to make co whole colosins, right? Because they'll, they'll kill your cell. So then you've got the, the sort of the toxin antitoxin system and Sorel has worked with such toxin antitoxin systems. So he might be able to tell you a little bit better than I, but we don't make the whole thing because if you make the whole thing, you stop making it and then you don't have the whole thing because it kills the cell. Um, or if you make the whole thing and you have to express it with the antitoxin and then you have to separate them out after, uh, we haven't done that. Okay, thanks, Joanna. I think for the sake of time, I propose we continue <clears throat> the discussion after the, the, the last talk of the, of the webinar, and we now move to Sarol's uh, talk. So, Sarol, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Patrick, also for organizing this great webinar. I feel that I'm really learning a lot, and uh, you know, the other type of uh, uh, membrane proteins, which are the beta, uh, uh, the, the outer membrane proteins. Let me share my screen. I'm going to switch to alpha helical uh, member proteins. And can you see my slides and pointer, right? Everything's fine. All right, thank you. So yeah, I'm gonna talk about uh, the novel design of uh, uh, alpha helical membrane proteins uh, for engineering receptor uh, functions. Uh, this is really work that uh, we've been doing for about 10 years. And I think with membrane proteins, you have to be very patient. That's uh, the number one ingredient, but in the end, it's uh, quite uh, rewarding. 
Uh, the main effort in the lab is on, I'll, I'll give this as a brief uh, background, the main effort in the lab is on soluble proteins. And over the past few years, we've seen that, at least with soluble proteins, again, we can develop, we've developed methods uh, that allow us to optimize proteins, even in cases that were considered intractable uh, in the past. So for instance, we have a method called PROS, which is accessible by web server, which allows us and others in, around the world to uh, design more stable, uh, soluble proteins again uh, by introducing many mutations throughout uh, the protein while maintaining uh, the primary activity of the protein, either binder or enzyme. And we've shown that uh, this method can increase thermal stability or, or stability for, uh, to denature uh, substantially and also remarkably improve the uh, heterologous expression levels. In this case, a human enzyme expresses very poorly in bacterial cells and the designs express up to about 2000 fold higher levels after uh, this design procedure. Uh, similarly, but for another purpose, uh, Funclib can optimize function, be it for uh, optimizing catalytic activity or binding affinity. And here I'm showing uh, how we've designed variants of uh, nerve agent hydrolase, uh, but ones that are up to about 4,000 fold more active than the wild type, as you see here in these uh, bar plots. So we're quite good at optimizing soluble proteins, and this has led to you know, diverse applications uh, not only from our lab, uh, people in other labs have also used uh, these tools. And that's great for, again, for soluble proteins. The situation is much, much harder uh, for member proteins. And so when I established my lab about 10 years ago, uh, we've decided to build capabilities uh, for member protein uh, design. Um, so first of all, we can ask the question, why are member proteins more challenging uh, to design? I think everybody in this uh, audience uh, knows the answer to this. Uh, member proteins uh, live in a much more uh, complex and interesting uh, environment than the soluble proteins. Of course, they also are surrounded by water. And in this uh, region, in the water um, region, uh, member proteins are no different from soluble proteins. But of course, they also uh, are surrounded by lipid uh, chains, which may also be hydrated to some extent. This is not widely understood, but uh, this could be. So in this region, obviously, they would be uh, much more hydrophobic. And there are also the polar uh, phosphate groups, which are also negatively charged in the uh, inner mem membrane uh, leaflet, which leads to what's known as the positive inside rule, where uh, membrane proteins cluster lots of arginines and lysines to counteract uh, the negative charge on the phosphate uh, head groups. What this tells us, though, is that the, the, the membrane environment is substantially different uh, to what a soluble protein uh, feels and sees when it, uh, during its life. And so designing member proteins really demands a plasma membrane specific uh, energy uh, function. So this was our first goal in this uh, project. Um, and I'll briefly run uh, through this. This was published already a number of years ago. In order to get at this question of how to uh, develop uh, an energy function for the plasma membrane, we decided to generate an experimental system that would enable us uh, to carry out high throughput screening of all mutants essentially in a membrane uh, span. So here we exploited two um, probes that were already described in the uh, 80s and 90s. Uh, we used, uh, we fused to the um, uh, pyroplasmic domain of a TMD of this um, uh, engineered uh, transmembrane domain, uh, beta lactamase. And again, already from the 1980s, it was known that um, survival on ampicillin uh, uh, is proportional to beta lactamase expression levels in the pyroplasm. So this, the beta lactamase reports on the expression levels or insertion propensity of the uh, engineered TMD. In the cytoplasm, we engineered uh, TOX-R, uh, and this again was developed already in the 1990s. Uh, this leads, this is proportional to uh, demerization of the uh, transmembrane domain. So now with a single construct, we have access uh, to two of the most important aspects of, um, uh, of uh, transmembrane. Sorry, um, I'll turn this off. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, my daughter. Um, so with uh, these two probes, uh, we have access to two of the most important aspects of uh, transmembrane uh, protein design, uh, insertion into the membrane and self uh, association. And we used, again, as I mentioned earlier, um, high throughput screening of this. We engineered essentially every point mutation across the TMD um, and screened uh, it on ampicillin and clonophenicol containing plates and used deep sequencing in order to monitor the 
uh, the levels of each uh, mutant in, this, in the surviving uh, library. We applied this strategy to a protein, a human protein called uh, CLS. And the reason we chose this uh, uh, member protein is that it's marginally ex expressible in the membrane. That means that it's especially sensitive uh, to mutations, either ones that increase its expression levels or those that uh, reduce it. And that led to a very large dynamic range. Uh, this shows the uh, uh, wild-type sequence of uh, CLS down here and each of the 20 amino acid mutations on the y-axis. And you can already see that, for instance, mutations in the core of the membrane domain to uh, the, the um, uh, aliphatic, uh, uh, large aliphatic hydrophobic groups is favorable, green, whereas mutations to the polar groups and charge groups in the, in the core of the membrane is, is largely unfavorable. Um, so we use this, uh, these data in order to extract uh, uh, profiles. These are position profiles for each of the amino acids across the membrane span, where the negatives are intracellular and the uh, positives are periplasmic or extracellular. And we, we process these data, but very, very lightly. The processing comprised mostly of um, negate or subtracting from each profile the contribution uh, from alanine, which turns alanine to zero throughout, and also smoothing uh, these profiles. But that's all we did uh, to process the data I showed uh, earlier. When you look at these data, you can already see uh, some things that are quite, I think, quite striking. Uh, the, the bigger the aliphatic uh, side chain, obviously the deeper uh, the, uh, the trough of, of these uh, um, profiles, the more hydrophobic it is, as one would uh, expect. And then the marginally uh, polar residues are slightly uh, unfavorable. Glycine and proline are highly unfavorable, and so are the highly polar amino acids. What's, I think, most striking about this is that the ar arginine, glycine, and histidine all show signatures of what is known as the positive inside rule again. Uh, this was described already by Gunnar von Heine in the late 1980s uh, based on bioinformatics analysis. And this was the first quantification in terms of biophysics and energies of, these, uh, of this very important uh, characteristic of membrane proteins. So this made us very happy about uh, these energy profiles, and we uh, wanted to start using this in design. But before using uh, them in design, we wanted to verify that they're also uh, appropriate uh, for ab initio structure prediction. This is essentially a way to verify uh, that these energy profiles are sound. So we developed a method called TMHOP uh, for ab initio modeling of uh, transmembrane homo uh, oligomers, and this is based on the empirical deep sequencing toxic beta uh data that I showed uh, earlier. And this shows that, okay, so how, how does this work? We start with an extended chain, uh, fold and dock it simultaneously uh, in, in a, a virtual uh, membrane, and we use the dst beta -L, uh, energetics to rank uh, the models and choose the uh, lowest energy uh, one. And you can see here for glycophorin A, we get a very accurate uh, structure, but I think any predictor uh, does very well on glycophorin A. It's not very surprising. Uh, so we turn to a benchmark of various uh, uh, transmembrane domains, and it still does uh, quite well, including in high order uh, oligomeric uh, structures. This again made us uh, quite happy uh, with the energetics and with this uh, protocol for ab initio structure prediction. And this is available online uh, if, if you wish to uh, use it. So now we felt that we were ready finally uh, for uh, de novo design of uh, transmembrane uh, receptor-like uh, domains. Um, so this project could not have been uh, done without the really magnificent help uh, from this uh, charming couple uh, who are leading their lab at Wehi in Melbourne. This is Matt and Melissa Call, who are excellent crystallographers and immunologists. And all the data I'll show in crystallography or um, uh, mouse work was done in their lab. And I'll point out also Ashley Davey and Nick Chandler who did this uh, excellent work. So we start by, uh, again, generating new de novo uh, transmembrane uh, domains. And I'll show you how this protocol works uh, for uh, homodimer. So again, we start just like TMHOP with uh, an extended chain. We then fold and dock it. I'm sorry for all the jiggles, but this is the way uh, the protocol works. This is still in centroid mode, what's called. It's not in full atom mode. And they look for confirmations that are uh, highly compatible with one another. And of course, all the moves are completely symmetric. Uh, and both chains the same moves in order to keep, keep the symmetry. Then, one point, uh, they reach yeah, the full atom stage and uh, sequence design happens instantaneously. This is using uh, Rosetta design, but using also the dst -beta -L, uh, energetics. And perhaps it won't be too surprising to you to notice that they're highly complementary, but also that they're 
many, many leucines on the surface, on the lipid exposed surfaces of these uh, design TMDs. So we noticed this and we thought, okay, this, is, this makes sense because leucine is the most hydrophobic amino acid. It makes sense if you want high insertion propensity, you want to really uh, put many leucines across uh, the interface. But we were suspicious of this because we don't know of natural transmembrane domains that have such a high propensity of leucines as we see in our designs. Um, so we next um, asked the question, what does uh, TM hop think about uh, these designs? And uh, what we saw is that in each case where we had these so many uh, leucines, TM hop also produced a variety of different alternative states for the designed uh, transmembrane domain. Essentially, this leads to uh, what Anastasia uh, described earlier as a negative design principle. If we see plenty of leucines um, uh, on the surfaces of, the, uh, of these uh, TMDs, leucines are so flexible and so hydrophobic that they can lead to a variety of different states, essentially misfolded states of uh, the transmembrane uh, domain. So in order to eliminate such negative uh, states, what we do here is go over with the Monte Carlo procedure, go over the surfaces, the lipid exposed surfaces of the TMD and mutate uh, the amino acid residues while trying to uh, bias the residue choice towards the composition observed in natural TMDs. So you see tryptophans, phenylalanines coming in, a variety of uh, residues which are still quite hydrophobic, but eliminate uh, the leucines. So now we get lower propensity of, sorry, a lower propensity of leucines. And now Team Hop is quite happy uh, with our designs. It leads to a specific uh, highly funneled energy uh, landscape. So we were happy with this. Uh, we designed 12, a dozen such uh, 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 dimers. We were hoping they were, di they were dimers. And our experiments did show that they formed high affinity oligomeric states in the membrane. But then we sent these uh, dimers to our collaborators at WeHi to the call uh, uh, lab. And um, they crystallized this using lipidic cubic phase. And for one of these dimers, we obtained a trimer. This was an unpleasant surprise. You may be a little bit, a little bit comforted uh, to see that the interfaces we designed, there are in orange and they form very similar interfaces to the ones we designed, but this is clearly uh, the wrong state, right? It's, it forms a trimer rather than a dimer. But this gave us an insight into uh, what is potentially an important principle for uh, transmembrane uh, protein design that these TMDs are actually prone uh, to forming higher order uh, oligomers. So, what we asked next is whether TM Hop would actually have been able to predict this if we had asked it uh, to consider uh, C3 symmetry uh, uh, for, for that uh, specific design sequence. And as you can see here, we could have predicted this outcome if we had considered that uh, this, uh, this was a possibility. And here we get TM Hop is predicting, sort of predicting, uh, the outcome from crystallography at very high uh, accuracy. So now we use this insight in order to change our design protocol. Um, so yes, a lesson, we must rule out undesired orientations and high order oligomeric states in design. This is a negative design uh, principle. So what we did next for each of the designed, uh, uh, let's say dimers or trimers or tetramers that we generated, we asked TM Hop to verify that it uniquely folds into a dimer in this case. So you see here that it's a highly funneled structure and a trimer forms very flat and the tetramer also forms very flat landscapes for the same uh, sequence. And again, if we want to design a trimer, we get a highly funneled trimeric uh, structure and no funnels for dimers and uh, tetramers. Um, so this was clearly a negative design principle um, and, and a very interesting one. And it's interesting to note here that this was a very productive crosstalk between structure determination from the call lab, uh, structure prediction design from our lab, and also a very productive uh, collaboration. Uh, so now we were finally successful. We designed dimers, which turned out to be dimers in crystallographic analysis, and also trimers, which turned out to be very uh, accurate uh, as well. And you'll notice that these dimers and trimers are not typically you know, rod-like structures. They're uh, uh, sort of banana-shaped, which is what you often observe in natural uh, member proteins. Uh, so I was quite happy uh, with this. At this point, our collaborators, which are again, uh, crack immunologists, uh, they asked whether they could use uh, these uh, designs in order to engineer um, immunological, synthetic immunological uh, receptors. And I know nothing about immunology or all of this, so now I'm, I'm gonna be, you know, please don't ask me too uh, very hard questions, but what I'll uh, show next. Uh, so CAR-T uh, or chimeric antigen receptor uh, uh, therapy is based on the following idea. Uh, uh, 
let's say cancer patients, uh, you harvest T cells from their blood, and then you genetically engineer their cells to express a synthetic uh, TCR, T cell-like uh, receptor, which is called uh, the CAR T. And in this synthetic receptor, the uh, antigen uh, binding domain, the ligand binding domain shown here, is engineered such that it would uh, interact with a surface antigen, let's say in a cancer cell. And now when you inject these cells back into the patient, these T cells find the diseased tissue and kill uh, the target uh, cancer cell. So this is fantastic. It's already being used in the clinic. It leads to fantastic uh, results, but often high killing uh, potency comes at the cost of high inflammatory response. And this is known as cytokine release syndrome or, or cytokine uh, storms. So our collaborators thought that by using our transmembrane domain oligomers, they may be able to tune, you know, dimers, trimers, and tetramers, they may be able to tune cytotoxicity and thereby also the inflammatory response. So here are some preliminary results that they got uh, using in vitro analysis, they used primary, mouse primary uh, T cells in order to do this. This is the reference uh, CAR T therapy used in, in clinical, uh, in, actually in, in the clinic. And here you see PROCAR1 is a designed monomer, PROCAR2 is a designed dimer and trimer. And you can see that the killing um, efficiency is, is somewhat higher in our designs than in the reference. This is in vitro though. So in vitro results are, are less uh, convincing, of course, than animal uh, results. What was much more exciting uh, in this experiment is that they saw, again, in, in, in vitro assays, uh, that the cytokine release across many of the cytokines uh, is much lower uh, in the designed uh, uh, constructs than in the reference, again, clinically used uh, reference. This, these are five and sometimes even more uh, fold effects in these uh, designs relative to the reference. And that suggests uh, that we're almost decoupling killing cytotoxicity shown here and the inflammatory uh, response using these uh, constructs. Um, so this was very uh, exciting. They next went to mice um, and injected, you know, harvested their T cells, uh, genetically engineered them, re-injected them. What you can see here, this is a very aggressive uh, human cancer. Uh, the empty vector kills very effectively. Uh, then uh, you can see that the uh, survival tracks the oligomeric state, the monomers are, are almost the same as the empty vector. Then come the dimer, the trimer. We also have a tetramer, which is very similar uh, to this, uh, um, uh, the reference uh, state. Um, so this is very exciting. Um, cytotoxicity is tunable as a function of the oligomeric uh, state. And I really love this um, uh, correlation. It's a correlation between the oligomeric state or anti-correlation between the oligomeric state and the tumor size, uh, showing the direct relationship between uh, the, the, the avidity of these receptors and their uh, cytotoxicity. So um, I, I'd like to summarize uh, what I showed you here by saying that uh, this shows a, a very nice, uh, sorry, light goes off, uh, <laughs> a very uh, nice, uh, you know, going all the way from basic understanding of the design principles and negative design principles of uh, membrane uh, proteins all the way to a potential um, uh, way to uh, um, control synthetic receptors, uh, even for uh, therapeutic purposes. So I started with a slide uh, saying that with uh, soluble proteins, we do quite well in optimizing proteins. I should say that we've now incorporated ds tbdil energetics also in the PROS stability design uh, method. It's still not available online, but we have tested this and it does work. Uh, we have been able to optimize the expressibility and stability of uh, several um, uh, member proteins, including a, based on an alpha-fold model, which I think is very exciting because this means that uh, uh, we may be able to uh, study and engineer uh, receptors, channels, and transporters for which there's no uh, crystallographic uh, structure. And I'll close with by thanking my group and especially uh, our collaborators again, Melissa and Matt uh, Call. Uh, from WeHi. And, you know, I, I really, I, I don't like international travel. I really like the idea of a webinar, but I should mention that uh, I, we met uh, with uh, the, the call group at the GRC conference that was organized by Chuck uh, a few years ago. And I think that without that GRC conference, uh, meeting face-to-face, -face, uh, this collaboration could not have happened. Uh, so thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Sarah, for this fantastic, super exciting talk. So the floor is open for question. Anastasia. And then there is light. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. That was really wonderful. So, and, and very, very exciting to step forward towards uh, 
towards self circles receptors. So I was wondering in your designs, um, big, um, so if I if I recall well, glycines play a major role in the in, in the interactions between incest. So how do you handle um, glycines in in your design? Are they explicitly mod modeled in the centroid uh, models, or is it just um, Rosetta coming up with those with, with those positions? Great question. So we, we in the centroid mode, we start from uh, a variety of different states, either polyglycine. Uh, polyalanine or polyvalene. So that's a way to control for either very close contact, a little bit further and, and more, much further. I think valine doesn't work so well. Um, so that's in centroid mode, but we don't encode the glycines explicitly. The reason why we get glycines in dimers, we don't get them in trimers and, and tetramers actually. Uh, the reason why we get them in dimers is that uh, the dst beta l energetics um, shows that glycines are disfavored lipid exposed. Right, so our energetics are sort of favoring them in the um, um, buried uh, position. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, Joanna. Yeah, great talk. Also, really um, impressive and great to see. Wow, work in mice and everything like that. Um, so, also a question about the centroid centroid positioning because I guess my instinct would have been like there are there are known particular geometries that are favored why are you reinventing the geometries like there are known geometries this one like goes like this but then if it's 20 degrees it's like this and you know it's got the 40 degrees and 20 degrees whatever it is um so why we do the centroids so we don't completely we're, we're not doing this in a completely unbiased way actually we found that if you do this in an unbiased way this is something that actually Jim Bowie had shown already in the 1990s you get mostly just lying helices lying down within the membrane which is a complete waste of time we bias the simulations to what to the um, um, uh, the angles actually observed in the membrane but not to a specific um, crossing angle because what we wanted to see is for dimers yes these are no um, uh, minus 40, plus 20, these are known. Uh, but for trimers and tetramers, there's no knowledge. Uh, so we wanted a general strategy. And also, um, if, if you think what we really wanted in this approach is, is a way of also sampling negative states, states that might appear, uh, even though they're never observed in nature, sort of like in folded states. And, and so we didn't want to bias um, these crossing angles to uh, specific angles we observe uh, in nature. We wanted to see something more broad. So then can so, you speak to what are, like now I'm dying to know, what are the trimeric preferred crossing angles or? We don't know. I think well, what we got are uh, much more uh, parallel to the uh, member normal mm -hmm. uh, orientations. Uh, we didn't make so many, I should say, right? We, did, we don't have a slew of uh, trimeric and tetrameric uh, states. We designed uh, essentially a few uh, trimers and one tetramer, and both of them worked as, you know, a trimer and tetramer. We stopped there. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Okay, thanks, sir. We have one question in the Q&A, at least, uh, from Ji Yuan. Um, how does the transmembrane domain influence the inflammatory cytokine release of CAR T cells? Okay, yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I, first of all, I should encourage everyone who's interested in the CAR-T aspects not to listen to me, but to read the paper. Um, but but uh, what I can say um, with my limited understanding um, is that um, the, uh, um, the call lab, after seeing this, they were extremely surprised by this. Uh, they did uh, additional microscopy uh, experiments on the, um, um, not natural, but the clinically used uh, CAR-T uh, which uses what's uh, CD28, which is an, a native uh, T cell uh, transmembrane uh, domain. Uh, so they tested uh, experimentally using microscopy. What does this uh, TMD, when used in the CAR T uh, construct, does it interact with other uh, T cell components? And what they saw is that it does recruit native uh, CD28. And that probably leads to the um, uh, increased uh, inflammatory response or cytokine release that's observed in um, clinically used uh, CAR-T constructs. Our designs are just orthogonal. We know that they're orthogonal. They measured it. They're orthogonal to CD28. We think that they're orthogonal to almost everything else in the T cell membrane, but we cannot uh, say that for sure. Uh, but what we think is happening is that simply the fact that they're orthogonal, highly expressed, and highly 
oligomeric, they form the correct oligomeric state, uh, they have high cytotoxicity, uh, but no recruitment of other uh, T cell uh, receptors. Okay. I think we had a question about um, Claudio who was asking the minimal amount of alpha helices required to build a stable ion channel is four. You think you can make one with three? An ion channel, that's, uh, that's asking for a lot. Uh, we tried to uh, form closed uh, structures. We didn't want anything uh, to go through the membrane because this is for a receptor, not a channel, but you're absolutely right. Um, this would be an amazing uh, further application. Uh, three helices, I think, uh, doesn't give you uh, a big enough radius, and I'm, I'm not sure, but I don't think it gives you a big enough radius uh, for a water chain uh, to cross, but I may be wrong on this. It's, it's, it's a really good question. Okay, so I'm going to close maybe with one question. So you showed that, you know, you had trouble getting uh, structural specificity with your hydrophobic binding interface, right? And you had to go through this negative design process. Now we've shown in the field of protein design that very polar interactions, you know, can help and dictate, you know, very strong structural specificity. So do you think that's something that you could design with your approach or do you think actually you are, the way you derive your salvation potential is actually going to penalize too much any burial of, um, of polar residues? Can you comment on that? It's a really good question. I think for um, larger, we were focusing on dimers uh, for a long time. And with dimers, it's very difficult to, um, uh, to see how you would place uh, polar residues uh, in the core of the membrane without exposing them to at least mm -hmm. some lipids. I think for higher order oligomers, this makes complete sense. You could imagine a tetramer or a pentamer where the, um, the core is really quite uh, polar, very similar to what Anastasia uh, showed for, uh, uh, beta barrels. Uh, we didn't go that way. I think it's 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 a really interesting way to maybe enlarge uh, the the size of what uh, of the designs we're we're getting. And also, this may be. I think it's actually going to be critical for um, encoding hetero oligomers. If you want hetero oligomers that don't homo oligomerize, I think such um, polar interactions, especially uh, complementary charges, uh, can be extremely uh, important for that. Uh, but we don't have results on that yet. Okay. Now maybe I just a last question uh, on on my side. You know, you've tried you know um, very specific conformation for dimers and trimers. Do you think can could you design you know maybe dimers or trimers with different crossing angles and, and would that have any effect on how you know um, cars can cluster the cell surface? Is that something you tried? Were you curious about that? You know, because you're it's so sensitive <laughs> to very specific um, um, number of monomers in your cluster. So. Yeah. You know, how sensitive is it to, to other structural features, right? Yes, I was, I was actually hoping when we went into this that the uh, various, uh, the dimer, trimer, and, 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 and tetramer uh, would show some, uh, in, in, within the CAR-T context, would show some geometric sensitivity. Yeah, the, the dimers have a fairly large crossing angle, the, the trimer less, and the, and the tetramer is essentially normal to the membrane. Um, but this is the, the if, if you look at the correlation, it's completely with the oligomeric state. I think in, in this specific system, it's just how much, how many receptors are you clustering? Um, but I'm, I'm very curious if, you know, applying um, uh, a system such as this to other receptors, you know, in, in for instance, in, in the EGFR family, mm -hmm. uh, the geometry seems to matter a great deal rather than, of course, not the living mm -hmm. um, So I think that now that we have these tools, um, they can be swapped in. You know, this was, uh, uh, I think Joanna pointed this out earlier, that people are using point mutations in order to investigate structure activity relationship studies, uh, investigate structure activity relations uh, in member proteins. Uh, but here with uh, these de novo designs, you can, uh, you can go much further than that and actually make uh, predictable changes, structural changes uh, in the receptor and see what the uh, functional outcome of that. I'm, I'm really curious to see if people actually take those uh, uh, and, and try that. Okay, I propose we stop here with the questions. Uh, we can continue after my, my talk. Uh, thanks again a lot, Sarah, for this fantastic discussion. And I think it's the beginning of a great um, uh, new era, right? Um, so I'm going to now, you know, um, share my screen and, uh, oops.
Ok. Do you see the full screen? Looks good. Good. Let me select just the pointer. Okay, well, we had a few. Hopefully, you're still there. Um, most of you. Uh, we had three absolutely fantastic talks, very interesting. And now I'm hope I can keep your attention on something a bit different. So switching gears and now telling you a bit what we've done in the lab um, over the past few years in terms of designing stimulating membrane receptors. And so as you probably all know, you know receptors, membrane receptors are the gateway of the cell, right? They sense a very wide diversity of extracellular stimuli and translate these stimuli into very specific intracellular responses. So these receptors help cells you know, to sense and respond to the environment. And it's very clear that if we can control how these receptors signal, if we can reprogram their signaling function or even create from scratch receptors with complete novel signaling function, this would have tremendous impact in, in a wide range of subfields of biology, including biotechnology, synthetic biology, and biomedicine. And I just would like to hear, just to mention three possible applications. For example, if we could you know, design biosensors that are very high binding selectivity to a particular ligand and very high sensitivity, then we could be able to perform, for example, high precision in vitro diagnostics or in vivo imaging. Within the context of synthetic cell biology, if we were able to, for example, design membrane receptors that can sense and recognize particular subclasses of peptides or proteins, and then couple the sensing to actually the activation of complex cellular machineries, we should be able to control, in a way, cell, cellular behavior. In, in that particular case I mentioned here, we could control cell migration. And finally, in the context of uh, therapeutics, uh, cell engineering, if we could design biosensors that sense particular molecules in the tumor microenvironment and, and couple the sensing of these molecules to the activation of um, uh, signals in, in T cells, for example, we could help CAR T cells to better sense and respond to the tumor microenvironment and eventually improve CAR T cell therapies. So this is a very broad overview of what we could imagine with um, designing membrane receptor signaling. So today I'm going to give you, I decided to give you a, a brief overview of three ongoing uh, research directions in the lab. First, I'm going to discuss to you how we can design receptor ligand binding. Then I'm going to discuss to you how we've been able to design and reprogram signal transduction properties in membrane receptors. And at the very end of the talk, I hope I have time to um, give you some insights into how we've been thinking about designing our single pass biosensors that can actually couple unrelated input and output signals. So we were first interested in, in designing uh, receptor ligand binding properties, and we were interested in doing that one in a very general way, but by reprogramming the binding properties of existing receptors. And so uh, remember, one of the goals we have here is to um, uh, use these engineered receptors as biosensors in the context of cell engineering applications. Somehow we want these receptors upon the sensing of particular ligands to be able to elicit um, in, uh, important intracellular function. And this would be extremely difficult if we were doing that through purely the novel design components. So, but we face at least two challenges, right? When we try to repurpose natural membrane receptors First of all, most of these receptors have been evolved by nature to not sense only one ligand, but more than one ligand. And so they often do so through um, a significant level of conformational flexibility. So they will adjust their structure to the binding of particular ligands. So that's one of the challenges. The second challenge is that despite tremendous progress in um, the structural determination of membrane protein, we still have many ligand bound receptors that have not been characterized. So somehow we had to come up with a technique to model flexible receptor ligand complexes. And so when we think about binding between two flexible molecules, we think about two completely opposite scenarios, either conformational selection or induced fit. In the conformational selection uh, scenario, uh, for example, here, the, the ligand conformation that fits the best to the rest of the binding side would be selected from the ensemble of possible ligand conformation that the ligand can adopt in, in solution. And the reverse scenario would be um, in use fit where binding of the ligand will actually trigger a change in the structure of the receptor. And so when we deal with binding of two flexible molecules, that, like this is often the case, you know, with natural systems, often binding occurs through a combination of these two scenarios and these two mechanisms. So somehow we wanted to develop 
the computational modeling technique that can capture to somehow this effect. And so we developed the method called IFOLD, which stands for Integrated Protein Homology Modeling and Ligand Docking, where we actually, within this uh, approach, we basically perform receptor modeling and ligand knocking in the presence of um, each other molecules. So for example, we are going to rebuild protein structures always in the presence of the ligands so that the protein structure can accommodate the, the, the position of the ligand and then vice versa. We also basically allow the ligand conformation to adjust to the protein structure. Um, uh, structure. And this way, we show that we could actually improve the prediction of ligand bound receptor structures. And we develop, uh, we further developed the technique recently for flexible peptides. So using this technique, we were wondering, well, can you actually design biosensors that can sense with very high sensitivity flexible peptides? So why are we interested in flexible peptides? Well, these flexible peptides, peptides in general, you know, provide um, and propagate very important signaling information to the cells. And so, for example, we have chemokine proteins and that bear a very small um, uh, peptide, flexible peptide tail at the terminus. And this peptide tail is known to actually engage with chemokine receptors at the surface of, of immune cells, trigger the activation of these receptors, and in turn, this will trigger cell migration toward gradients of these chemokine proteins. So for a number of interesting uh, cell engineering applications, we were interested in actually designing novel um, flexible peptide receptor pairs. And for that purpose, as a proof of concept, we selected a chemokine receptor for which no active state structure had been solved. We applied our um, uh, IFOLD uh, protocol, and we ended up by modeling you know, the, an ensemble of conformation of the Y-type chemokine receptor bound to this flexible peptide. And then starting from these models, we started to basically redesign the binding interface with the peptide and, and the receptor. And here, the binding interface is shown in, the, in a very schematic way as a graph, where each node basically corresponds to potentially a particular peptide residue or, residue or receptor residue. And then depending on the starting uh, flexible peptide receptor complex, we've been able to increase binding contacts, also increase binding and activation contact between both molecules. And then the hope for us was to be able to manipulate and, and reprogram you know, cell migration properties using these new design pairs. So we went through the design and then we selected some designs for experimental validation in the lab. So we performed a number of cell-based assays and we were able to identify a number of new um, design receptor peptide pairs that showed uh, uh, very significant and hence signaling potency and some, for some of them also efficacy. We were wondering you know, how do these signaling properties actually translate in terms of cell migration? Do they allow you know, cells to actually migrate um, with higher potency than, than, than cells that would be um, elicit, that would be um, um, exposing at the surface the, 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 the Y-type system. So what we've done, and this was in collaboration with Caroline Arbor at the Ludwig Institute of Cancer Research in Lausanne, we tested these new chemokine receptor peptide pairs. Uh, we tra tra transfected them in, in human primary T cells, and we used boydum chamber assays to actually test uh, the migration of the cells expressing at the surface these cognate uh, design pairs. And here is the result. Was so uh, at these particular conditions, we observed um, uh, relatively modest migration uh, potential for the for the wild type system. And then from but then as you can see here, we observed that for most of the design peptide pairs, we were able to elicit much stronger migration. And for both pairs that included the design receptor um, recognizing and sensing the wild type peptide, but also for the design pairs where both the receptor and the, and the peptide were designed to, to form uh, orthogonal interaction together. So through this project, which was exciting, so it showed us that we could, you know, somehow uh, using this IFOL technique, identify an, a number of important binding contacts and reprogram this contact to create, you know, now very sensitive um, biosensor ligand pairs for a number of um, interesting synthetic cell biology applications. So, if you design a biosensor, so the binding of the ligand to be sensed is, of course, a very important step. But then you need to make sure that somehow, when you want to design signaling biosensors, that the structural perturbations that are induced by the binding of the ligand are very efficiently transmitted on the other side of the membrane. Right? And this is an allosteric process. So how do, can we actually control this allosteric single transaction? Can we you know, develop methods to actually design these properties? And so just to remind you a bit how it works in terms of allosteric. So when a ligand binds to one side of the membrane, somehow it's going to elicit a long range conformational change. 
and which eventually will open binding site on the other side of the membrane and, and allow the recruitment of a particular downstream effector of protein. So somehow this long range conformational change is made possible by the fact that these two binding sites are mechanically coupled. And, and this long range communication is made possible by the existence of some allosteric residues that we call here allosteric propagated that are organized in networks that can very efficiently propagate any change in structure or dynamics induced by the binding of the ligand from one side to the other side of the membrane. And so somehow it's been shown um, by molecular dynamic simulation that these other residues organized in these networks tend to display highly correlated motions. So somehow we can identify them uh, by performing these uh, dynamic simulations. So this led us to ask a question, well, can we somehow predict these pathways and can we develop a technique for modulating the other responses in these receptors? And so what we've done here, we developed a technique uh, that combined molecular dynamic simulation, very fast calculation of protein dynamics with um, uh, sequence selection. So this uh, method works in two steps. We first uh, start with either an experimental structure of a receptor that we want to redesign or a ligand bound homology model. Then we perform um, a molecular dynamic simulation to identify you know, the motions of the different residues. And then from these motions, we identify the, the residues that have high correlation in their motions and make predictions about potential pathway that connect both sides of the receptor. And then when we have identified you know, putative allosteric sites, we, we go through the design step. So we basically can now select amino acid combination of these different sites that will modify the way these uh, allosteric residues actually uh, um, are coupled with each other. So we calculate the effects of this mutation on both receptor stability, ligand binding, and also correlated dynamic. That is a proxy in our calculation for allosteric coupling. And then we can evolve you know, the, the sequence of the receptors for particular optimal path properties. It can be a new rewiring, so two different sides of the, um, of the, of the binding side being coupled together, or it can be just enhancing the elastic coupling of the system, et cetera. So with this technique, we were wondering, well, can we first you know, predict correctly pathways in these receptors? And can we use the technique to actually rewire the right pathway and modulate the larger response? So we decided to, um, we selected a, a G protein couple receptor, the dopamine D2, uh, as a proof of concept. This dopamine receptor has been characterized by a number of structures, but also we have a large number of possible um, uh, ligands that are known to regulate the function of this receptor. And here I'm showing you a structural clustering of all the, the ligands that have been that are known to actually activate the receptor. So they are all agonists and they all basically um, uh, lead to the activation of G protein upon binding to the to the GPCR. But then what you can see is that these receptors, the fact that they have they perform similar function, they have very different chemical structure. And this was puzzling to us. In a way, what does it mean? You know, presumably all these ligands are going to contact the receptor through different set of contact with the binding site. So it's very hard to imagine that these ligands, all these ligands will engage with the same allosteric pathway. So maybe actually these different ligands will potentiate and, and trigger activation of the receptors through distant pathway. And so this was in a way our hypothesis. We basically hypothesized that ligands with different structure may actually display or bear different chemical uh, allosteric activate, activator group that can engage and potentiate a uh, different signaling pathway to activate the same G protein uh, downstream in, uh, at the intracellular site. And so this is true, right? And if we can identify this pathway and if we can redesign them using a method, well, we should be actually able to to manipulate uh, this pathway and, and change the sensitivity of the receptor to particular ligands, right? And be able to design our biosensors with very fine-tuned signal and response to specific ligands. So in order to test this hypothesis, we first decided, well, can we actually design first um, uh, receptors that have much higher sensitivity to um, a particular ligand? And this, we decided to go after the, the native ligand dopamine for, for the dopamine receptor. And interestingly, in the same cluster, there was another ligand, which is actually very weak agonist. So it has very weak binding affinity to the dopamine receptor, but and yet is, uh, has very similar structure to dopamine. So we were wondering if our hypothesis is right and if we can actually increase the, the allosteric response of the receptor to dopamine. Um, and basically, this the same design should also um, uh, elicit stronger response in, in, uh, upon binding to serotonin. 
So we went to the, uh, we performed in silico calculations who basically scan the entire allosteric transmission region of this GPCR for identifying alternative uh, amino acid combinations. And we are um, able to identify a number of designs that basically showed up to 100 fold a higher sensitivity than, than the white eye receptor for dopamine. When we started now testing the same designs now in response to serotonin, which is a very weak activator of dopamine receptors, you can see here that you know, upon titration um, by serotonin, we have very little response coming out of the, of the white eye V2. Uh, but now we observe that using the design that we optimized for response for, for dopamine, we also observed a very large increase in efficacy in the, in the response um, to the, the ligand serotonin, close to the response that native serotonin receptors uh, show for the same ligand. So somehow we validate our, uh, our hypothesis saying that be, because serotonin and dopamine share a very similar chemical structure, they engage you know, similar binding sites on the receptor and trigger and potentiate similar uh, pathway. Now, of course, we were wondering what happening with the other ligands you know, that have different chemical structures. So we started to basically test the same designs perform those saturation uh, with, with the other ligands and we observe very distinct effect. And here I'm showing you here the summary of his results in a heat map. So here the color code you know, refers to the shift in allosteric efficacy compared to white time. So we have a positive shift, which means that our designs um, um, increase the allosteric response to, for a particular ligand. If the shift is decreased, this means that these designs encode a lot of function uh, for a particular ligand. And we observed that we had, of course, as we, because we had designed these, these, um, uh, uh, these receptors for eliciting strong response with dopamine and serotonin, we observed the highest um, uh, increase in our circuit efficacy for this ligand, but we observed uh, a very different effect for the other classes of ligand. And then we, we perform Pearson correlation between the effect of these on the designs on these different ligands. We observed that, of course, as we corroborating our hypothesis, we had high level of correlation between the response of ligands coming from the same structural cluster. Now, this was in a way validating our hypothesis, saying that indeed, you know, uh, uh, probably uh, structurally and chemically similar ligands, you know, engage with similar pathway and to activate G proteins. Now we were intrigued by the fact that we had a completely outlier here with bromocutin. And what's happening with this ligand? So though I just would like to remember you that you know, bromocutin, although it's actually a full agonist ligand to dopamine receptor, it has a very different structure than dopamine. And so to, and we were wondering, when presumably, this ligand is going to engage different pathway inside the receptor to activate G protein. So to, to try to address this question, we perform molecular dynamic simulation. And here I'm just showing you a very rapid snapshot on the pathway that we were able to predict using this simulation. We observed, you know, some overlap between some of the pathway that connect the ligand binding site to the G protein binding site, especially uh, the ones that go through TN5. However, we, we observed that depending on ligand, we had very we had quite distinct uh, allosteric propagator, allosteric pathway going through TN6 and 7. And somehow um, this you know um, suggested that these two uh, ligands could actually um, uh, engage different pathway to um, to elicit the same um, G protein mediated signaling response. So, if this is true, then we should be able to, using these um, um, predicted as right pathway, start rewiring them selectively and induce uh, ligand specific responses. And so, this is what we've done. So, um, based on the now, based on this prediction, on prediction of this distant, distinct allosteric pathway for the two ligands, we started to redesign this pathway. And, and we observed that we were able to now selectively. Um, uh, modif modulate you know, the response to bromocutin while not affecting significantly the response to dopamine and vice versa. We were also able to, uh, to perform uh, and, and uh, generate a very high um, um, a dopamine receptor that had very high um, by, um, uh, selectivity to dopamine because we were able to abrogate the signaling response to bromocutin. So somehow this, uh, this study is, you know, suggested that First, that pathway really matters, right? And that uh, different ligands can actually um, signal and um, trigger intracellular uh, function through um, engaging with different uh, adversary pathway within the receptor that to some extent, um, our method based on molecular dynamic simulation and computational design could not only predict important adversary determinants, but also um, be able to rewire and reprogram these responses.
So what I showed you so far is that, you know, we've been able to design some uh, basic biosensor properties uh, starting from um, G protein copper receptor scaffold. Now we wanted to, uh, we were interested in whether, you know, the, the same concept and some of these methods could actually be, be applied and extending to the design of single path uh, receptor biosensors. And also we were interested in, in trying to design biosensors that could couple you know, um, unrelated input and output signals in a way that nature has not able to do. And for that purpose, we basically ask the question about well, can we couple unrelated ligand sensing and signaling function? And for example, there would be a number of interesting signaling output that could be beneficial for, uh, for T cell therapies, for example. And so uh, in a nutshell, um, we basically developed an, a new approach for the bottom-up assembly and design of single pass multi-domain biosensors with programmable input and output behaviors. And I think this entire method was actually uh, guided by the observation that in some single pass membrane receptors, you know, the propensity for these uh, receptors to timerize upon the ligand binding and also the level of mechanical coupling between the ligand binding domain and the transfer membrane region were critical, were key determinants for the signal transduction. So based on this concept, we developed a technique um, where we First, the first step in this approach was to identify, you know, potential uh, ligand sensing domains and signaling domains that would elicit the proper and, and the, the signaling function that we were uh, looking for. Then in the second step, we were wondering how can we actually select now uh, extra little domains that can efficiently couple with, with ligand sensing and signaling uh, domains. So for that purpose, uh, we basically construct libraries of interacting extra cellular domains and we either, you know, we model them based on existing external structures or we basically plug them and identify putative dimer conformation. And then in a first step, we basically construct assemble, you know, full length receptors by combining different combination of these extra cellular domain in order to couple, you know, the ligand sensing and the transmembrane region. And then we rank, you know, different potential chimeras based on not only the stability of the, of the receptor construct, of course, but also based on their ability to um, um, form um, homodimer contact the interface, and also based on their ability to, to be mechanic, to mechanically couple, you know, the ligand sensing domain and the transmembrane region. And then according to our hypothesis, you know, optimal chimeric uh, uh, construct should actually exhibit optimal signal transaction if they maximize dimer stability and mechanical coupling. So we basically started a collaboration with the um, Arbor Lab at the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research here in Lausanne. The Arbor Lab was interested in actually developing new classes of biosensors that can actually sense, you know, a number of soluble molecules from the tumor micro environment. And upon sensing these molecules, elicit, you know, strong signaling response for the T cell in order to achieve more selective but sustained CAR T cell responses, especially in solid tumor. And so um, I'm going to go a bit fast here, but you know, what we've done with our method is actually try and rank a number of different uh, constructs that we are designed to, in order to couple, you know, the same thing of these transmembrane, um, uh, sorry, these uh, tumor microenvironment factors and, and, and uh, some particular signaling output that we wanted to elicit. Um, our method, you know, predicted um, um, distinct, you know, mechanical coupling and dimer stability of bond binding with this TME factor. And then in parallel, you know, the Arbor Lab has been um, validating experimentally with these cameras um, in human primary T cells. So we have here on the left, you know, negative controls, positive controls with IL-15. And then what we, the first thing we observed here is that um, the construct that we had designed, you know, could elicit strong signaling responses upon sensing this TME factor. So this was something very positive to us. And we observed also distinct level of signaling responses. Um, what has been shown, what has been done now in the Arbor Lab visa, a very recent results we obtained, is that in preclinical models of solid tumors, we can now, you know, if we now express these biosensors in the context of CAR T cells, we can indeed, you know, improve the anti tumor function of these cells. So these are preliminary results, right? And but they suggest that somehow we can use now these domain assembly technique to accelerate the discovery of these chimeric receptors. And we hope that, you know, they will impact, you know, the, the development of these, um, of these cellular therapies. So I would like to uh, finish here and just conclude. So I showed you evidence that, you know, we develop methods to either model uh, flexible receptor ligand complexes, but also start to modulate, you know, responses of these receptors. 
Using these techniques, we've been able to design ultra sensitive, you know, flexible uh, receptor peptide complexes through optimization of binding contact, right, in, in the binding pocket. We also showed you that, you know, uh, in proof of concept, we've been able to uh, somehow um, modulate the way GPCRs actually sense and respond to particular again through the redesign of uh, particular, sorry, pathways in these structures. And I will show you evidence that, you know, we are starting now to test. Uh, a new way to um, create, you know, um, single pass uh, multi-domain receptors um, from scratch. So basically, by combining different um, um, domains together. So we hope, and of course, what I would like to say here is that uh, these techniques were validated in, in proof of concept, right? And so uh, we need to further validate them in order to test their robustness. But we hope that at some point that uh, these the signaling receptors that we've been able to design and we could continue to design using this technique will you know impact you know the, the both synthetic cell biology and also therapeutic cell engineering applications so i would like to stop here and thanking you know key members of the lab who've been doing all the work because i haven't done anything so uh, on the design of flexible um, peptide receptor complexes this was done mostly by rob here and Aurelien. The design and reprogramming of um, dopamine D2 responses uh, was done by Daniel, uh, Madi, and Aurelien as well. And then um, the, the, the last part of the talk I mentioned about the bottom of assembly of these, of these multi domain receptors was mostly done on the computer side by, by Andreas and Lucas, who are actually not, uh, not shown here on this picture. So I would like to thank for your attention, and I guess I will take any, any question now. Patrick, would you like me to, I'll ask some questions yeah, um, for you get, so that you don't have to read them yeah, yourself. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to get back to my screen. Sorry about that. So, uh, Surihat uh, Chula says something that we can all agree with. Excellent talk, Patrick, apart from impressive body of work. Um, could you please comment on the clustering of the GPCRs, which I believe tends to happen quite often in the membrane, and how could that affect the allosteric mechanism that you explained? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. I didn't touch on that, but um, it's true that, you know, confinement in membrane can often lead to clustering of membranes. So that I mean, Charles, uh, you know, mentioned this, um, this mechanism and, and, and showed us that, you know, this, in, this can strongly impact, you know, the response of these receptors. Um, so we've been working on that question uh, using um, uh, dimerizing uh, GPCRs. And we've shown that actually, and I don't even show you that, that work here in the talk, but that depending on how you know, these receptors actually dimerize, they can dimerize uh, by engaging different transmembranic interface. This can impact actually how they recruit downstream effectors. And this has to do with the fact that, you know, at least in the class of GPCRs, you know, you have, you know, downstream effectors like G proteins or beta resins that have very different shape. And so the way they engage the receptor um, uh, will uh, be very sensitive to, to how the receptor actually dimerize or oligomerize. So, so that's what we have. Now we have also uh, obligate, um, um, obligated dimers like class C GPCRs for which we have plenty of structures. And, and, and in, in these receptors, you know, I think we start to have evidence that you can have cross talk between different uh, protomers. And, and that you know um, uh, you can actually achieve um, active state conformation by uh, through an asymmetric rearrangement of the structure, and this has been shown recently uh, by Cryo. Yeah. So, but I think the 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 the, the, the I think we have plenty of, of uh, investigation to be made here first before we really understand how you know allosteric uh, propagation can involve multiple protomers. And, and right now, in terms of dopamine D2, we completely exclude and, and didn't look at that, although dopamine D2 is known to dimerize, but, but um, this is not something we really looked into in this class A GPCR. Anastasia, do you want to take the next question? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, this, is, this was really exciting. I mean, controlling the uh, dynamics of a, of a mem membrane protein, membrane protein receptor, just by design, uh, it's, it's really, Mind blowing, um, really, um, yeah, really exciting. So I wanted to ask you: um, Do you see um, do you see any trade offs from that point of view between the um, 
the stability of the receptor and its um, allosteric signaling potency? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And so uh, we'd love to be able to answer it, um, but I think for that we would have to, you know, make, you know, um, side by side comparison between different receptors. I think right now for GPCRs, uh, GPCRs from the class A that we looked at for you know, dopamine receptors that are known to sense, you know, a very wide diversity of beacons, they tend to be quite flexible. You know, the opposite, the extreme opposite side would be rhodopsin that has been evolved by nature, you know, you know to really um, respond to the isomerization of the retinol. And so it, um, uh, I think it's been shown that, you know, the flexibility of the receptor is much lower than for any other um, uh, ligand binding receptor. So, um, and indeed, you know, it could be that um, the rigidity of some receptors, uh, uh, you know, is, is related to the fact that they may have less potential to, to, um, to generate multiple pathways. What we've seen here, what I didn't show is that for the dopamine D2 receptor, when we started actually designing this pathway, it's not only the strength between the electric residues that we modify, we see also complete rewiring of the pathway. So somehow the receptor goes around some of these uh, sequence perturbation and, and allow through also reposition of the ligand to find other pathway to, to direct signal. So there is a very high level of plasticity that we actually had not envisioned even at the beginning of this project that we are starting to uncover. So it's still a very much of a black box for us. You know, we, we start perturbing them and using these uh, computational technique to, to very much try to understand um, the level of plasticity of this, of this process. But now also, I think we, we um, it's going to be um, um, a question of whether, you know, how are these allosteric properties encoded in other classes of receptors? And this is also um, something very interesting to investigate. But, yeah. Awesome. Uh, so Mark Dumont has two questions that I'll ask you. Do you have, do any of your hypersensitive receptor exhibit elevated constitutive activity? And he also adds, the analysis of the allosteric pathways seems ideal for looking at biased signaling pathways. Have you looked at this? Yeah, so these are two great questions. So, so uh, what I didn't show is actually uh, what we've been able to do when we, when we do the, the sequence selection and, and we calculate the effect of any sequence perturbation on, on, on the receptor structure, we actually first look at you know, whether the actual, this, this uh, se sequence design actually modulate um, the equilibrium between inactive and active state structures. And I, I completely occluded this aspect of GPCR. They actually are multi-state receptors. So, so, so that's the first thing. And then we, to some extent, you know, the, the switching properties encode the level of basal activity of the system. So we have some of these sequence perturbations that are going to, for example, increase selectiv selectively the, the active state structure stability. Then, then we expect you know um, enhanced continuous activity, and we've so we've shown that, and we published you know, two years ago uh, some designs where we we were basically uh, modulating the equilibria between the two states. So, so we can we can to some extent predict that as well. Uh, now, the question of uh, whether these allosteric pathway prediction can predict bias signaling. So, this is something we're also investigating, and we have some preliminary evidence that we can manipulate also how a given ligand is going to trigger two distinct allosteric pathway. But this is always thanks to the knowledge of how these different downstream effectors actually bind to the sub, to the intracellular side of the receptor. So we basically bias the selection of the pathway that we look into. Um, and so we basically, for arrestin biased signaling, we will basically uh, analyze mostly electric pathway that connect, you know, ligand binding site with beta arrestin binding site, etc. So, but this is possible. And, um, and also other groups have been looking into that. Do we have time for one more question? Um, yeah, I guess. Yeah. How much time do we have? I think we can continue, or we can also go back to questions to, to the other talk. So feel free to, to continue. OK, so I'll give you one more question um, from Jose Maria Delfino. Uh, mm -hmm. How could the design process profit from the knowledge of the intracellular protein partners involved in the response? Yeah, yeah. So this relates to one, one of the questions that Mark asked and one of my answers. Um, I think, you know, if we, if we assume that somehow, you know, that's right pathway need to connect, um, you know, both effector binding and ligand binding, somehow they need to reach, you know, the, the, binding, the binding sites that contact the downstream effectors. And so if you can actually identify um, distinct binding residues for two different effectors, and eventually you can look and, 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 uh, and, and reprogram, you know, selectively pathway that, that 
and that triggered the signaling through the particle downstream effectors and not the other one. So this is a bit how we've been looking at the problem. Okay, so thank you so much for the stimulus. So Anastasia, you have another question. Yes, I, I had a question for you actually uh, about the second part of your talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, sorry, do we have, uh, do we have time? <laughs> um, yeah, I I was wondering because it was it wasn't clear clear to me. So what kind of conformational change do you induce in uh, in your uh, transmembrane domain and quite at the end your extracellular domain upon binding of the uh, of the ligand? So what are you forcing there? So, you know, what we, what we basically do is that we model, you know, ligand bound GPCR structures uh, through docking and then relaxation of the, of the GPCR. So depending on how the, which ligand is binding to, um, to the receptor, we'll observe, you know, different structural perturbation in use by the ligand. And this is how somehow we can capture you know, when we run after a molecular dynamic simulation. So we basically, this involves both different starting uh, conformation um, of ligand bound GPCRs, but also this is going to, you know, depending on the size of the ligand, depending on how many contacts it's forming in the binding pocket, you know, what we've seen is that, for example, bromocryptin is very large, and so we tend to rigidify the binding site much more than dopamine. So um, this is a bit how, you know, the kind of dynamics that comes out from, from this distant uh, ligand binding to the same receptor. I'm not sure I'm answering your question correctly, but well, I, I, I'm I'm wondering. So, so maybe I, I I misunderstood. For when you when you binding when you when you fuse the domains on the extracellular side, so to the to the single path transmembrane domain. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, I was just wondering. So, so, so basically, um, I mean, all, is all those transmembrane domain do they have two conformation, and you kind of switching from one to the other, or do you? Kind of forcing them them apart. So what's happening there? Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So that's a great question. It, it has to do with the fact that are we do we explicitly design switches or are we basically uh, modeling you know a particular uh, ligand bound in active state conformation? So uh, right now you know the the, the the approach we've been having and this is you know an ongoing study. We've been just looking at the, the active supposedly active state. Um, of the uh, of the receptor, and what we've been doing is basically identifying combination of these extra domains that can uh, optimize the coupling between the the ligand bound domain on the extracellular side and the TN region, which we either we have structures of the active state or we model in active state. So this is very much active. So it is just one part of the picture. We are not looking yet at the switching, and we actually, in a way, pleased to see that. Uh, we don't have very high level of quantitative activity because it could be that you know, we, would, we would stabilize so much the active structure of that receptor that even without ligand, you know, that, that receptor would elicit strong signaling. But at least for this particular construct, we haven't seen that. But that's a great question. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so Cheryl and Chuck left because of other duties. Um, I also, I think it was a great, great webinar. Thank you so much, all of you, to, uh, to be here. Uh, thank you, Anastasia and, and Joanna, for participating. It's been great fun. I also learned a lot myself, <laughs> so that's fantastic. Um, I have to run home also because of my kids, but um, I wish you all you know, a great end of the day, a very inspiring uh, few weeks, and I hope to see many of you uh, uh, physically, I mean, on site at, at all the meetings. And, and we hope that this discussion will trigger, you know, new interest in membrane protein design and also new webinars with other, because again, uh, there are a number of colleagues who do great work in membrane protein design that could not, um, um, that we could not fit here in this webinar, but there will be hopefully follow-ups. So thank you so much. Take care and uh, hopefully see you soon. Patrick. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks, sure. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Bye, Joanna.